Well, this is a special, a very special video slash podcast uh, here at the Merriman Financial Education Foundation because today we, and I say we, Daryl Balls, myself, are going to speak with Chris Pedersen about his new book, Two Funds for Life. Two Funds for Life. And not only has he written a book about this, there it is right there. A quest for a simple and effective investing strategies. A quest for simple and effective investment strategies. Uh, Chris, I'll tell you, uh, I hadn't read the book for a while. So I think like Daryl had mentioned too, we both went back and, and, and read it. I, and I think it is, it is just terrific. And I realized that we really made a big mistake. And when we brought it out on our website and told people about it, we should have given them a taste of that of that book. And so uh, in the notes, there is going to be a link to the, the preface intro and the first chapter or two. Um, but it will, I think, give people the real good sense of what it is you're trying to do. Now, I got to tell you, that um, I've read some very famous books that have an opening line that I still remember. Uh, uh, the, the it's it, it is the best of times and it is the worst of times. Or or call me Ishmael. Um, I'm Daryl. I'm sure you've got a famous one that you can remember that that uh, that reminds you of some famous book, but. This opening that you have here, I am a financial wizard. <laughs> I do not know another investment book on the shelves of the library that starts with, I am a financial wizard. <laughs> so I want to know about that. I think that's pretty cool. How, how did you become a financial wizard? Well, I do, I do go on to point out in the book that uh, my financial wizardry is still a work in progress, but uh, that phrase was a gift to me from my grandfather. Uh, when I was a small child, uh, just learning to speak, I think he thought it would be fun and funny to have a little you know, two-year-old running around the house saying odd things. And so he taught me two phrases. One was Potawatomi Plum, which I still don't know if I've ever had one of those. I think it's an heirloom fruit. And the other was, I am a financial wizard. And I think the reason he taught me that was at least partly aspirational. I think he wanted me to uh, learn eventually something about personal finance. And it has been a motivation for me later in life. Uh, as, as a younger person and through most of my working years, I think like a lot of people in their working years, I was focused on making money, not investing money, mm -hmm. which uh, we all know is uh, not the right, not necessarily the right order. Ideally, you should do them both together. Yeah. And fortunately, because of the legacy I had from my parents and my grandparents, I did okay. You know, I did, I did invest along the way, but I really didn't invest in becoming you know, more of a financial wizard or more knowledgeable about personal finance until I started working with you and the foundation just a few years ago. That, that's interesting. And so what has the impact been on your very bright children? I mean, uh, it seems to me that way that they may not have been born the financial wizard you were, but they actually have a chance to become financial wizards at a very young age. Is that working? I think I'm being as successful as my grandfather was. <laughs> you know, it's it's hard to convince young people to focus on investing when they have so little to invest. Mm. And uh, I think on the plus side, they do understand that time in the market is important and that compounding is going to be an important part of their future. And I think they also understand that timing the market is a fool's errand. My daughter thanked me during the 2020 market downturn from COVID. She, we had a call uh, where, we, where that came up and she said, I am so grateful I grew up in a family that taught me not to freak out when the market's down. And, and that's, you know, it's just a really, really simple idea. But um, that one idea will help, help them 
tune their wizardry skills, if you will. I mean, it doesn't sound like wizardry, but just that one simple idea actually has some wizardry wisdom in it um, that can help protect people as they are accruing their wealth over the years. Yeah. Well, you had said early on when you started the project on the book that one of your goals was to create a book that would be for your children, that they could use as a guide for the long term. Did it accomplish, do you think, what you set out to do in that regard? A little bit. Uh, Some yes, some no. I've actually... uh... I've written a three by five card, and I think that that's about where their uh, their their patience is. I, I think for them, they just don't want to spend much time on personal finance, and so the the three by five card nuggets of wisdom that's enough for them. Uh, but I really had two two goals in mind when I wrote the book. One was to uh, provide reasonable. Uh, prudent advice to young people like my uh, my kids who are all adults. So when I say young, I mean young adults. Uh, and some of them getting even to be maybe on the long end of young adult. So I, I think it succeeds in terms of having advice that is relevant for them. But the other thing that was really important to me, and this kind of gets at the quest nature of it, was that I wanted to convince myself through rigorous research and back testing that the advice we were offering was genuinely prudent. Uh, one of the biggest fears I have working with you in the foundation is that we would ever steer people the wrong way, that we would give them advice that wasn't uh, sound. And so uh, part of the reason the book is as thorough and long as it is and has as many charts and graphs or back tests in it as it has is that I was not just uh, you know in it to get to the answer. I was interested in providing enough information that it convinced me and that it would give the information that would convince an investor who gets partway down one of these paths and starts to have doubts. Yeah. Uh, because I think the more educated you are, the more you understand the range of ways that an investment strategy can perform, the more likely you are to stick with it. Uh, because you're less likely to hear the news that, oh, this time it's different and all the rules have changed. You're less likely to believe it because you can look at the history and go, oh, you know, stuff like that's happened before. Mm-hmm. You know, this is within the reasonable range of expectations. I think I'll stay the course. So this Two Funds for Life starts with a a commitment to an investment product that all three of us would agree agree is probably the greatest investment product ever built for investors who don't want to try to play the market, but simply want a a, a real long-term strategy that they can attach themselves to. T- tell us just briefly about that product. Well, that, that product's a target date fund, and uh, it's it really is amazing that you can, for around 15 basis points or less, so that's, you know, 0.15% per year uh, or less. Today, it's less for Vanguard and most 401ks. For that tiny amount of money, you can get a fund that includes the whole stock market, a little bit of bonds in your early years, automatically adjusts for risk as you age so that when you get to your retirement year, you're in a relatively low risk position and you have high confidence in the amount of money you're gonna have entering retirement, continues to lower the risk as you go into retirement and gives you a great shot at having enough money to last your lifetime and provide protection from inflation, broad diversification. I mean, it really is an amazing world we live in that, that, and and for a lot of young people, they're gonna be defaulted into it. They're gonna hire into a corporation or a company that has a 401k savings plan. and, And by default, they're gonna get an email that says, we have signed you up to invest 3% 3% or 5% of your income into this retirement plan. And if they're lucky, it's going to say, and we'll increase that every year until you get to the maximum so that you get the maximum match from your employer. 
and over your lifetime save you know something close to 10 percent uh, of your income into this very prudent investment it's an amazing amazing tool yeah so we start with that you start with that as the base investment and yep. in fact I think that you make a pretty good case that if that's all somebody did for the rest of their life, they would come out okay, that they would probably be able to retire if they, in fact, what is your position on the percentage of income that you believe the young adults in their 20s uh, should be committing to the long term? If somebody is just going to save into a target date fund, and especially if they're going to uh, plan to retire early, uh, you know, maybe before they have access uh, to their their four hundred one k without penalties, then I would encourage them to save uh, fifteen to twenty percent per year. Uh, two reasons: number one, that'll give them the room to save a little bit into a taxable account at the same time they're saving into a tax deferred account, and then they can draw from the taxable account before they are old enough to draw without penalties from the tax deferred account. And number two, the target date fund. Uh, if you look at, I've got this in the in the book. I think it's in the chapter on saving. Uh, if you look at how it's performed in the past and whether it would replace all of your income before you get social security, you know, if you save 15 to 20%, it's got a very high likelihood of doing that. Now, if somebody's willing to become educated by reading the book and, uh, or reading, we're talking millions, either way, you know, you're going to become educated, more educated and invest in a strategy that's a little different. You might be able to get by with a 10% savings rate. Um, or if you're willing to work until you're 65, you know you're going to work until 65 and you're willing to rely on Social Security for a significant amount of your expenses, again, that might push you in the direction of being able to save 10%. So bottom line is it's, it's going to be very personal, but I think anything in that 10 to 20% range, uh, people should feel good about. And if you can only save 1% or 3% or 2%, start there um, and just Every time you get a raise, give your future you more of the raise than you give present you, and you'll do great. Yeah, yeah that's good advice. And 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 so you, you start with the target date fund. The target date fund, in order to do better, has to figure out a way to prudently take more risk. Is that a fair comment? That is a fair comment. Um, the only footnote to that is that there are uh, better and worse ways to take more risk, right? If you, if, if you, uh, the target date fund, you can think of, we often speak of bonds as the brakes and, uh, and stocks as the gas, right? Well, you could, you could just buy more stocks in the total market. They're going to move up and down at the same time as the stocks in the target date fund move up and down. So ideally, what you'd like to do is take a little bit more risk in something that has both a higher expected return and that moves up and down at a little bit different times from the total stock market. And the best solution I was able to find is small cap value. Mm -hmm. And I go through a few different options in the book and try to explain why that one is the one that we prefer. But um, the, the bottom line is it's broadly available. You can get ETFs and mutual funds in the US internationally. Um, you can get them for relatively low cost. There is enough of a selection that there's competition that drives that cost down. Um, and they do zig and zag a little differently from the total market. So the, the upshot is uh, if you take just 10% and so imagine you're a saver saving 10% per year. You can put 9% into a target date fund and you're taking 1% of your annual earnings and put it into small cap value. Just that move of the 1% over into small cap value can increase your lifetime available funds, what you have to spend in retirement and what you have to pass on to heirs by 25%. Uh, at least that's what the history says. If the future is anything like the past, it may be a little higher, a little bit lower. Who knows? It's totally unknown. But, but that's a big change. 
25% uh, is a huge change. And some of the more aggressive strategies we lay out in the book can more than double what you have across a lifetime. Um, and those, those strategies are things like scaling the amount you put in small cap value with age, uh, or holding some of the small cap value into retirement. Uh, it turns out holding a, an allocation to small cap value into retirement doesn't just increase the amount of money you can expect to have, but it also increases the safe withdrawal rate and reduces your chances of running out of money. It increases the resilience of the portfolio. So those are, those are some really big benefits. And I, I think a lot of people would be very interested in them. So you mentioned now kind of from, from when you're in your 20s until you're retired. So the book does cover what to do as a first-time investor, but it is also trying to help the investor who has, let's say, the five to 10 years before retirement or in retirement. Do you give recommendations to investors at all of those ages that, that, so that the book can help almost anybody in that regard? I do. Uh, it's um, for the retire for people who are in their later years, I think the most interesting information in the book is the impact of holding part of their allocation and small cap value in terms of it increasing their safe withdrawal rate. And I also, uh, there's a chapter where I look at, you know, what if you have a less than perfect scenario? Because um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of us who have, my, my scenario didn't go the way I thought it was going to go, uh, right? I mean, I think none of, none, the best laid plans of mice and men, right? I mean, it, it, things go sideways. And so there's a chapter in there that talks about what if you, instead of having 40 years of work, only have 30 years of work? Mm -hmm. And what if when you retire, instead of you know setting your withdrawal rate at 4%, you just say, I'm sorry, I have to have $50,000 a year, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and these strategies for somebody who has to retire early and live off a greater percentage of their income, they still help. They actually help quite a bit. Uh, mu they do much better than just the target date fund. And they do, uh, I, you know, I, I, there's a whole nother chapter uh, on um, I, just simple three fund solutions as well. So if somebody's trying to figure out, is there a way to have a, a simple portfolio that gives you the kind of diversification we advocate in the ultimate buy and hold or the, the four fund portfolio, uh, there are ways to get close to that. And so for in somebody who's just worrying about the equity allocation and how to, how to create that, whether it's in retirement or pre-retirement, um, I think that chapter is useful as well. And, and in the book, you have a number of different ways to use small cap value. As you mentioned, it could simply be 1% of what you put aside. By the way, you said that would increase 25%. Does that suggest then that if I put a, away 2% instead of 1%, that it would give me an opportunity to be 50%? ahead of what I would have otherwise been. Uh, that's one of the, one of the um, things I knew that interested students would ask, <laughs> right? So there's uh, the very first appendix in the back of the book is kind of, well, what if, what if I did something different? And there's a whole bunch of different scenarios in there. Uh, so you can look and see, you know, what's the impact on the safe withdrawal rate, the, um, you know, the, the, the drawdowns, there is added risk that comes with this, right? And it is uh, a few percentage points. So that's really important to understand. And that's why I say you have to become educated. If you want to pursue a different strategy, you've got to become educated so that you're willing to tolerate and stay committed to the plan through those added risks. But if you look at the, um, like the total retirement dollars and the median end balance dollars, uh, they go up quite a bit. So um, for a target date fund alone uh, across this lifetime simulated experience, it's 4.4 million when you add those two together. If you just put 10% of your portfolio 
uh, into small cap value, you end up with 5.6 million. Mm. Um, historically, this is the median, right? So sometimes higher, sometimes lower. Mm -hmm. If you do 20%, it's 7.4 million. So from 4.4 to 5.6 to 7.4, it makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. Makes makes a huge which, difference. Yeah. Which figure are you or table are you reading from, Chris? Uh, that's in Appendix One, which is. Uh, I was adding together two things in figure 67. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so that, I mean, just to make sure that people understand the four versus five versus seven, this is tracking not just what it's worth at retirement, but then the impact of how much money we can take out to live on and how much we leave to others, correct? It's just adding the last two. It's adding what you take out to live on and yep. what you leave to others. So that's, right. I mean, that's the, yeah, total it's what return. you spent and what you gave. Yep. Yes. Exactly. And that's your lifetime benefit. Yep. Right. And, and out of curiosity, approximately, if you go for the 7.4 or whatever it was, or whatever, but all of them, what is the amount of money that someone has approx approximately invested to get there? Well, the, the assumption for all of the scenarios in the book, it, just to keep the numbers round, uh, is that you save $10,000 per year increasing with inflation. And if that just sounds like it's way too much and you want to save $1,000 a year, divide all the numbers in the book by 10. Okay. Right? So it's just to keep the numbers round. But what that means is that somebody saved a real after adjusting for inflation, $400,000, because it's 40 years of $10,000. And they turned that into these numbers I'm quoting are also real. I tried to make the book as credible and meaningful as possible. I focus on the results you would, the spending power of your results, if, if you will, rather than the in big inflated numbers. Those are in the book if you want to find them. But, but that means you turned four hundred thousand dollars of real spending power into many millions of dollars of real spending power and that's that's the i i think if there's only one thing a young person gets out of all of this work that we do it's that you can give yourself a hundred percent raise that's effectively what you're saying is if you choose to be a prudent investor across a lifetime you can easily double the spending power you will have across that lifetime. Uh, if, if you choose not to be an investor, then you've given yourself this huge headwind compared to all those people who chose to be an investor. And why would you do that, right? I mean, why would anybody want to disable themselves? Yeah, uh, well, and of course, the reality is, is that there are just so many people who want them to spend money on something short term rather than long term? That's true. And well, then, and it does, and it does take some good behavior to earn these returns, yeah. right? So again, going back to uh, that table, um, the drawdowns that you have to live through or had to live through. The worst case, going back to 1970, for the target date fund, it was um, uh, let's see, 20. 42, 42%. Okay, let's make sure they understand what that drawdown is because, uh, be, be, this is because the I worst. know that both Warren Buffett and Peter Lynch have told us if you're not willing to lose half of your money, you shouldn't be in the stock market. By the this, way, that's short term, not long term. Uh, if you do it right, it should be short term, not long term. But so that drawdown is what is the definition? It's how much your account has declined from its peak value before it starts to come back up. So uh, you can think of it as the worst day when you check your account, yes. <laughs> right? It's the day when you check your account and you go, I can't believe it. I used to have 44. Actually, it'd be more than 44, but I, I, I've lost 44% of the money I used to have. That's the way, that's the way it's going to hit you. Right. Yeah. And, uh, so it's actually 42% for the target date fund, 44% for a 10% allocation, and almost 50% for a 20% allocation. So 
if you can educate yourself and learn that, well, historically these have been temporary and the people who tolerated them and continued to buy when the market was down were rewarded for doing that, yeah. you've got a good chance of enduring it. Yeah. You have a, a part of the book that's, that is, uh, is dedicated to resiliency because uh, really, that's that's what people need to understand: is what does it take to come back, and what what is when you look at the resiliency of the target date fund versus the target date plus a, a, a percentage in small cap value? What happens to the resiliency? Well, across across a perfect scenario, the target date fund does great, never runs out of money. So if you're going to work 40 years and save regularly through those 40 years and then set a 4% retirement withdrawal rate and take it out increasing with inflation for 40 years of retirement, you know, you're, or 30 years of retirement is what's in the book, that you're, it's prudent. You know, it, it doesn't historically run out of money. Uh, now, if you go back to 1928, it might run out of money sometimes <laughs> because uh, things were a little bit worse. But we only had this data going back to 1970. So although we do some 1928 scenarios, most of it goes back to, to 1970 because we have more data there. Uh, if you add a uh, if you go to the um, imperfect scenarios, though, where you don't get to work for 40 years and you have to retire early and you have to take out more money, uh, which often happens to a wide range of people, um, not by design. I had to retire early, right? I mean, it, it's, uh, I had years when I didn't work for much of a salary between jobs. Um, you know, it, all these s surprises come along. Then the target date fund doesn't do quite as well. And the uh, approaches that add in small cap value do better. And the reason is pretty simple. Um, that small cap value is providing you very meaningful diversification. It behaves differently from the rest of the target date fund. And that diversification and, and the fact that you're willing to tolerate a little bit of added risk with good behavior, mm -hmm. those things give you resilience. They give you added protection. Why? Why does it not go up and down with the large cap blend asset class? Is, it, is there an easy answer to why? Well, the, the uh, simple way to think of it is that these different kinds of companies thrive in different kinds of economic uh, circumstances. Uh, and you can kind of imagine where where that would be the case. But um, I can give you a specific example of uh, think of periods of higher inflation or lower inflation. When you buy a an expensive growth company, when you buy into Amazon, which trades at very, very high uh, share price compared to the amount of earnings it generates, the reason you buy it is that you you're placing a high value on its future earnings. The earnings five years down the road, 10 years down the road, maybe even 15 years down the road. Well, um, if there's a period of high inflation or inflation starts to come up, those earnings become worth less money in today's dollars um, because by the time you get them, they're going to be worth less. Mm -hmm. And so growth companies don't do as well uh, in periods of higher inflation. Uh, companies that are value companies, you typically buy them not because of their earnings 20 years from now, but because of the earnings and the assets that they hold today. So they're less impacted by inflation. Uh, so that's just one example. But um, small behaves differently from large for similar kinds of different reasons under different economic conditions. And value behaves differently from growth mm -hmm. under similar, uh, similarly different economic conditions. Yeah. And certainly, Daryl, the work that you've done with the four funds, the U.S. large blend and large value and small blend and small value going back to 1928, and, and we can look at it one year at a time, it really is amazing how those things switch back and forth. Uh, it, 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 it looks very difficult to try to 
to predict. If I knew how to do it, I would be an amazing market timer. But it, it, <laughs> be a financial <laughs> wizard. I'd be a financial <laughs> <laughs> wizard. <laughs> yeah, the, the, one, but, of the, one of the interesting things about uh, that sort of gives you an idea about small cap value versus large cap blend is the, uh, the fine tuning table that you did a while back where we showed 100% small uh, large cap blend with the S&P and fine tuning over to 100% small cap value. And when you look and see over the last 51, 52 years, 51 years, I guess it was, um, who, who, who did better during any one particular year? And 27 out of the 51 years, small cap value had a higher return, 24, small cap or large cap blend had a had a higher return. So it's it's a lot more equal than you might think. Um, and it does tilt, at least it has over the last 50 some odd years to the small cap value. Well, and, plus, add- and plus the other thing too is when when one outperforms the other, it's okay, how much more does it outperform? Exactly. And I don't recall the numbers right off. I do, hand, I do, I got it. You got it. Okay. Sixteen well, percent when small cap value outperforms better than large cap blend, and eleven percent better when large cap blend outperforms. So uh, there is an extra punch there that historically comes uh, from small cap value. And for young people, whoa! You look at how small cap value does after a big bear market. Uh, it tends to be a star performer uh, historically, much more than than the S and P 500. So there's a lot of really good potential in all this this work that you guys have done in terms of people being able to take advantage of it. And the question is how we get them to take advantage of it. I mean, we all know what we get paid for doing all this work. Absolutely <laughs> nothing. Financially, we get a lot of psychic income, but the psychic income comes when we actually find that young people are doing this or even older people who haven't figured it out. But what do you think the key is, because I know you're both trying and I'm trying to get young people to one, read the book and two, move to action. Do you have a clue what we have to do? Chris, what do you think? Uh, well, I, 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 it would be self-serving of me to try and get everybody to read my book. So, uh, No, it wouldn't. <laughs> you don't make anything. <laughs> That's true. I don't make anything. All the proceeds go to the foundation. I, I, you know, uh, I, I am more... I'm more concerned with the second part than the first part, though. I'm more concerned that we get people to act. Um, And part of the reason I described the book as an owner's manual for the strategy is that uh, I think we can get people to act by explaining the benefits, you know, just getting somebody to nudge, uh, you know, one tenth of what they're saving for retirement into small cap value, I think is a relatively uh, doable job. I, I I think we have lots of evidence for it. I think the benefits justify it. Uh, I think uh, I think that's a relatively easy story to tell, and it's a relatively easy decision for somebody to make. And so I'm hopeful that a lot of young people will do that. the The reason I think they may want to own the book or read the book down the road, and the reason I position it as an owner's manual is that somewhere partway down that path, I don't know if it's year five or year 10 or year 15, they're going to doubt their strategy. And I think that's where uh, the book really can come in to, to help them out because they can look at the detailed back test of that strategy and they can say, well, 10 years in, what does it say I should have? You know, on this strategy, 10 years in, what does it say I should be experiencing in terms of drawdowns? Mm -hmm. Uh, 1928 was worse. How much worse? Mm -hmm. Right. And they can look at all of these things. And I think that that historical perspective is what you need to stay the course. 
And so whether somebody reads the book front to back, cover to cover today, I care less about than whether the book is helpful to them in keeping them committed to and staying the course on the strategy that they choose. I think if it does that, then then it will have you know been very, very well justified. And Daryl, what would you add to that? Do you have anything that you think might motivate young people to do the right thing? Well, not having much experience with interacting with young people, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure um, how, I, how I, I would do that. I have a nephew um, who has taken to this and he's, I mean, he's doing the strategy. So I don't recall asking him, why did you do that? Um, <laughs> and that might be a good thing to do sometime. Let's say, why did you do it that way? What, what convinced you to do that? Now he's an engineer. So, you know, when you look at this book, you, two th one of two things is going to happen. You're going to go, oh, wow, this is great. Or you're going to go, oh, wow, are you kidding me? You know? <laughs> and so I think, I think trying to figure out how you work to get that work that dichotomy in terms of, of reactions to get people to to look at the look at what they can take from it and and not get overwhelmed by the part that they're not interested in but i i think we have to be careful and uh i don't want to overlook the fact that if you just read the first couple of chapters or the mm -hmm. the, the the preface and, and the first chapter Chris lays it out what he wants you to do. He doesn't give you all the fine tuning stuff that 50 or 60 or 70 year old people could do. And that, but that's later in the book, but, but he tells them what these steps are going to be. And it's very, very simple. It is. The question is, do they really want to understand? We are told by every famous investment guru or expert that don't do invest in anything you don't understand. And so I think Chris does a wonderful job of explaining what is a target date fund. And if you don't get it, then I, I would love to have an email because if they don't get it, I'd be more than happy to talk to them. <laughs> but, but the other thing is then, why small cap value? And I think you do a great job with that as, as well. And you lay all, in fact, what you do, I think, Chris, is you undersell the, uh, the excitement uh, that could come from the number that you know is not the real number. Because the number we know people would just love to see is the number before inflation is taken into consideration. I mean, when I show somebody that a $365 investment for a newborn child, if, if, if put aside now, and then as soon as that child is able to have money put into a Roth IRA, you move the money into a Roth IRA, you keep it in small cap value for 70 years. For 70 years, and you legitimately if it gets a 12% compound rate of return, which is much less than it has the last 90 some years, they will have over a million dollars. Now I have was born a salesperson. So I talk <laughs> about the million dollars. You on the other hand, you talk about the fact that inflation adjusted, it's only worth about a hundred thousand. And, and so as a salesperson, I want to make the sale for the million. They'll figure the rest out later. <laughs> you are being very honest. I mean, and I'm not putting myself down or, or accusing you of under, but, but the reality is the world does not talk about real dollars. It always talks about nominal dollars. And in a sense, that's our competition because, well, our other competition is cryptocurrency, but, but it, it, it is something that people need to understand that you have really taken all the fluff out of, of, of the long-term return. Because, and that's the, that's the reality of what it will buy when they get there more than likely. 
Yeah, it's a, you know, it's a balance. Um, it's a tension uh, in terms of how you teach this stuff. Uh, and I know it's uh, a point of debate you and I have had sometimes. We've, we've talked it back and forth. Uh, my fear when we talk about the nominal returns, the big numbers that include all the inflation dollars, is that it will uh, be used by investors to justify a lower savings rate. You know, that they'll undersave. And uh, I think so that that's the way that could go sideways. I do have both numbers in the book. You can look at it both ways. But if I was a 25 year old and I was having a conversation with myself about how I was going to help future me, I'd want to know what the inflation adjusted numbers were. Yeah. I'd be wanting to know, am I? Am I setting up future me to be able to spend forty thousand in today's dollars, or am I setting up future me to spend to be able to spend ten thousand in today's dollars? And I think that uh, that's why in in my book I chose to emphasize the real numbers uh, yeah. because I I just didn't I didn't want people to get overly optimistic about how easy it was to save for the future. Well. Did you want to say something, Daryl? It looked like yeah, I, I think I think I think Chris's strategy is is a is a good one because when you look at nominal dollars forty or fifty years out and you see a big number, even though it's nominal dollars, you tend to think about what that means to you today. today. Yeah, and that's a poor conclusion to draw. You, when I was way, in, I think. when I was in opinion. high school, and I had some of the very first financial thoughts that I ever had, it was about buying a house, and I was thinking, you know, how much is it going to cost to buy a house? It was a hundred thousand dollars. That was about what a house cost. Um, if if that had been my lifelong goal to someday have a hundred thousand dollars so I could buy a house, <laughs> I would have never made it. <laughs> and mine because, was nineteen, by the way, nineteen thousand. Yeah, that I, first house. Yeah, and you know, and by the time I was old enough that we actually bought a house, it was more than it was more than double that. Yeah, and now it's ten times that, more than ten times, almost twenty times that where we live. So you know, it just. It, it, yeah, inflation is hard to internalize. I want to encourage uh, all of our listeners and and viewers to open up uh, that uh, chapter, uh, open up the uh, the opening comments. I thought the the things you talked about that that motivated you to to do this work, Chris, I think are worth people understanding. And I think one of the reasons it's important to, to read that is one of these days, you're going to have a question. And while we cannot give financial advice, your question may be a matter of simply understanding. And it is my belief that between the three of us, one of us will be around here <laughs> to help for, for, for some time. And so it is a commitment to more than just writing the book, because I know that one of the things likely that's going to come out of this, because now we have an investment calculator that we didn't have when you started to write this book, which means that we can work hopefully at some point in the future to be able to attach the investment calculator to this book. Is that a fair, uh, a goal, a dream? It's a good dream. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> one, one of the one of the reasons there's so many detailed back tests in the book is that creating a back test for something like a two fund for life strategy where the asset allocation is changing over time and and the contributions and withdrawals are changing over time uh, is non-trivial and I can't share the tester I use. Uh, because of data licensing and other things. And so far, we haven't been able to figure out to how to modify uh, the lifetime investment calculator Craig has created to do those kinds of things either. So, so I, I just threw all the tests in because I can't share the calculator. I figured at least people can learn from a wide range of tests. 
Yeah. Uh, and if you're not into the graphs, you know, if they're what intimidates you, as Daryl said, just look, just skip them. <laughs> just skip the graphs. Just read the text. The text is pretty easy, easy to read. And uh, and you can almost get away with just reading. You, you, you've you kind of bolded some some headlines, if you will, uh, yep. within each chapter. And you, and you can almost get away with just reading those as your first introduction through the book. Yeah. You can and skip and them. that'll you can... take an hour, if that. To do that. Oh yeah, if if that, I'll bet you could do it in half an hour. Yeah, yeah. So um, I th- well, I hope take- someday we can do that, uh, yes. Paul. I hope someday we yeah. can make the lifetime investment calculator work for two fun for life kind of scenarios, and I'd love to tie it to the book. Then, yeah. The uh, the fun for me is uh, I do not give investment advice, but like last evening when my daughter asked me if I would help a friend. Well, how can I say no to that? And uh, I talked to the friend and she has saved at 29, she has saved uh, 45,000 plus. Wow, good for uh, her. Which is great. And I loved it because her boyfriend has been following your work, been following your best in class, been following your two for one strategy. And he was on the call. In fact, he, he almost grabbed the phone away from her because <laughs> he wanted to get in on this. And, and, but what we ended up doing because we wanted to make it simple was she is going to open up a Roth IRA to do the small cap value. And she's going to use the 401k plan to do the target date fun. It isn't going to be perfect, but Uh, it's lovely. We don't, doesn't have to be perfect. Nope. But she gets the theory and it's a simple automated way to be able to put it to work. And, uh, and he's thrilled. He, 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 he is thrilled. And by the way, I think it's wonderful when young people who are not yet married have a chance to talk about money and agree on something. Because if they don't, troubles happen later. Yeah, money and personal finance are one of the greatest sources of couple stress. So uh, figuring out how to have those open conversations early, that's great. Yeah. So So I want to go ahead, Daryl, please. Yeah, you mentioned that that doing that strategy was not is not perfect. Well, as Chris points out in the book, perfect is the enemy of good enough, you know, and if it's good enough, that's, that's better than trying to strive for that extra little bit of complexity that maybe will make it a little bit better. It's also makes it harder to maintain, which maybe makes it not as good as if you would have just left it simpler to begin with. Yeah, I I, I agree. One of the things I really like about that approach for her, too, is that because she's got these two buckets and she's going to live with them for some extended period of time, I hope she stays committed to it. By the time she gets to retirement, it may give her the confidence in small cap value to continue having an allocation to it into retirement. And all of the back testing says that would serve her and her heirs very, very well. Yeah. You know, I, I think that is uh, really, uh, people do not realize the impact of getting a thorough education as an investor early in life and living with it for 20 or 30 or 40 years, because I've got a, a bunch of my friends that are 100% in stocks and they're about my age. And I say, how can you do that? <laughs> and and they say, well, I've been doing this all of my life. Yeah, how could they do anything else? <laughs> They've got a bigger pot of gold by far than than what I have because I've been more conservative. Uh, and so if the market goes down, they probably still have more money than I have set aside. And that's because they learned to take that risk. They learned to live through the tough times But you also, if you look at the kinds of things that they've invested in and just held onto it, they aren't wild and crazy. They 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 are relatively conservative investments. And so I I really feel it's going to be wonderful. And here's my idea. 
My idea is your book could be a gift at the holiday season to a young person. And it would come with, uh, let's see, you got your calculator there, Daryl. Let's say, I don't see mine here right now. Let's say that you gave them a hundred dollars in a um, uh, in a Roth IRA, and let's say that it compounded at twelve percent for let's say fifty years. What is that hundred dollars going to be worth? Have one of you got that? Yeah, hang on a second here. Fifty years. Yeah. Y yes. Okay, I'm doing math in public here, so this is dangerous, but. <laughs> <laughs> that looks, it's about $29,000. Okay. So what, what they could say is, here's the book. That was a one-time $100 investment. Yes, one time. Yeah, right. One time. And after you read the book, I'm going to give you $29,000. <laughs> and you explain to them how it becomes worth $29,000. Yeah. And, and, and they learn something from that. And then you've got them actually maybe wanting to read the book. In fact, Chris, how much of the book do they really need to read in order to understand enough to, 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 to start and to, and to believe in it? Well, if, if you read the first chapter, some people will be convinced enough to start. Yeah. Uh, and that was my sister, she read the first chapter and said, well, you gave me the answer. Why do I need to read the rest? <laughs> I trust you. You know, that was, that was kind of her strategy. It's yes. like, I trust you. You wrote the rest of the book. You must know what you're talking about. Why do I have to read the rest? And by the way, she's a mathematician. So, <laughs> <laughs> and I told her, I said, because there's going to come a day when you doubt your trust in me. But anyway, yeah. I think I think that the first chapter is enough to get the story on how to do it. And then I think the the rest of the book is really about follow on questions. How much should I save? How risky is it? How much downturn am I going to have to tolerate? What's the impact on my heirs? You know, how much do I have to spend in retirement? There's all of these follow up questions. And that's why I wrote the book was to answer those. Yeah. And the list is there, by the way. They'll see the list of questions yes. you answer. Yeah. And when I read it, I thought, who could not want to know the answer to those <laughs> questions? So, well, gentlemen, as always, it's fun to work with you. And I really appreciate what you're doing. And Chris, this is, a, a, you did a knockout job. And uh, is there anything that you want to say about the book that... Uh, to close well, it, it could not have been written without my association with you and the foundation. So it could not have been created without what I've learned from you and without the access to the data that we have uh, for doing the back tests, without the tremendous help I got from Daryl in detailed reviews and feedback and analysis and and uh, you know, even down to down to the nitty gritty of how we model asset classes and how we apply expenses and correct for inflation. I, it just it couldn't have been done um, without you. I never understood how hard it was to write a book until doing this, and uh, you both made it possible. Um, there were many other people who helped as well. So I'm uh, I'm fortunate to be the author, but uh, grateful for all the help I got. And I have to give a shout out to my daughter. She did a number of just beautiful illustrations for the book. Yes. She's, mm -hmm. she's got some amazing talent and it was fun to be able to showcase that. And so if nothing else, there's some pretty pictures as you go through to, to, to wake you up if you were getting bored by the finance. Yeah. And, and also to, to mention here that, that, uh, uh, Margie Baxley and, and, uh, uh, Asia Griffin, who who worked with the foundation, they actually get paid, uh, and, and and they put the book together working with you, uh, and, which is pretty cool. Yeah, Mar yeah, Margie did a fantastic job doing the the layout and design, and uh, her her daughter uh, Renee uh, did mm. the cover design, and San Sandra Hickman did a wonderful job on editing, making my text actually English. So, I mean, yeah, a whole bunch of people. And there's, there's more in the acknowledgments section because I've had 
so many this this community for being a community of people who are many of them are trying to make money i'm constantly surprised at how generous they are with their time uh you know larry swedro and meb faber and wes gray you know these are all people who have day jobs are trying to make money yeah. but they're very generous to answer questions and to uh, take a newbie like me and and help him understand so uh, it's just it's it was a great experience yeah well thank you thank you and daryl thank you as well and uh, we have uh, got a lot of exciting things coming up one of the things I know we have coming up is the three of us agreed that next year we're going to get together and do a, uh, a, a discussion once a month. So uh, that was a wonderful commitment uh, by you folks because you guys, because I know that our viewers and listeners uh, appreciate you uh, weighing in and remembering that I'm the salesperson and you two are the engineers and we all know what that means. So uh, we, uh, we, we appreciate you a lot. Thank you very much. And thanks to you who are watching or listening and please, please, that we, we already, we just heard this. If we can get people just to read that first chapter, whether they don't read the rest of the book, that is available free uh, at, in, in the notes to this uh, podcast or this video. So uh, let's let's help uh, our young people have a better financial future. And I can think of uh, nothing better than what, not only, by the way, what Chris has done, but the work that Rich Buck did uh, with me on putting together uh, the uh, We're Talking Millions, 12 Simple Ways to Supercharge Your Retirement, two books that might be good uh, for the holiday season. So all the best to you and, uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks guys.